All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kelsey Maynard. I'm the small business advocate for Invest Atlanta. I want to say thank you for joining us this this evening as we are discussing some amazing, uh, amazing information about government contracting. Really trying to understand how to create a competitive bid and how to, to what what are the steps that you need to take to uh, even bid on a contract. Um, so this goes along with our series that we've been doing this month about government contracting. So we walked through number one, how to find government contracts. So where what are those places to look and what does the information mean that we're looking at? And then we were able to talk with the SBA and talk about not only how federal contracts work versus uh, city, state, and county, uh, but now looking at also how to be competitive. And, and we talked even about how to, to get certifications, how there were different certifications that were specific to federal contracts versus ones that were specific to city, county, and state contracts. So we learned the difference, difference about that. So tonight, I think, culminates all that. So really saying, all right, I've learned all the information. Now, how do I actually apply for one of these contracts? What, how do I create a competitive bid? And what does that look like? So I'm excited to have that conversation this evening. But before we get started, I do want to let you know this. Um, I'm... Again, Kelsey Maynard from Invest Atlanta. Invest Atlanta is the economic development arm of the city of Atlanta. And um, what we do here with our small businesses is really try to make sure that we provide, uh, we we give exposure to things that are going on within our organization as well as what's going on in the city. And then also give you access to resources. So whether that's getting business assistance to help you with the various products and things that you need to do to be a successful business, or is it giving you access to resources like we're doing tonight to help you learn how to be a better business and go from kind of surviving to thriving. So without further ado, I would love to get this thing started, but I do have two updates, not updates, but here, here are the house rules. I wanna answer these questions now. Yes, we are recording this webinar. So the, recover, the uh, webinar will be recorded and it will be emailed to you tomorrow so that you can have that to go back and review and make sure if you missed anything that you'll, you'll see it. Number two, that we have a Q&A section. So um, at the end, you'll be able to ask questions, but I also understand that if you have some burning questions right now, just go ahead and put it into the Q&A space and we'll be sure to, to see that. And I'll make sure that we answer every question that's been put into the Q&A space um, towards the end. Cause we don't definitely wanna make sure that we get through the presentation because the question that you may have may be answered, but I don't want you to try to remember it to the end. So go ahead and put it in the Q&A. And if we answer it while we're talking, I'll notify that in the Q&A space to let you know we answered it live, or I'll be typing in answers as we go by. Um, but before we get started, I would love for you to go ahead and put into the Q&A. Just use that as a chat right now. So I would love for you to say, hey, who? What's your? you already know. <laughs> what's your name? The uh, name of your business, what your business does. And this allows me and, and, the, and everybody else to kind of see who's in the room. And I can say like, hey, all right, that business has come through a couple of times. So Charlene, I thank you. Uh, with TGK Trucking. I've seen you several times in our webinar, so I'm excited to see you here as well, getting the information. So go ahead and use that Q&A space, type in your name, your business name, what your business does. And um, and while that, I'll introduce Daniel Jones as well. I'll let her come in so she can introduce herself and we can get started with this amazing webinar this evening. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for having me back, uh, Kelsey. Um, again, I'm always excited to talk about, you know, government contracting in all its different shapes and forms. So, um, but today we are going to be focusing on um, developing a compelling proposal. And this is really important because obviously in government contracting, I mean, there's many ways to win contracts. I mean, you know, we have, you write a proposal, um, we have unsolicited approach, we have sole source approaches, but, you know, mass majority of the time it's going to be through proposal writing. So we want to make sure that we really understand how to write proposals. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I do have a presentation here. And just to give you a little background. So for those who uh, were not on the last call that I was on, I'll just give you a background on who I am. So um, I founded my company back in 2015. Um, we currently, we started out as a consulting firm. We worked and we um, and did BD strategies for small businesses, worked all throughout the United States um, and then also worked heavily in the DMV area, building out business strategies in the government space in particular. Um, we did pivot 
like most companies during COVID where we actually started contracting with the government ourselves. And since then, um, we started contracting internationally. Um, we have contracts overseas in Senegal, Zimbabwe, and we also have two contracts in South Africa. And we also have a lot of state and local contracts here. Just recently, we're now moving in the federal space and we already have some partners working in the federal space. So government contracting is my background. That's my area of expertise. Helped a lot of businesses grow and use those own strategies, my own strategies on my company to get us to where we are today and we're growing and expanding. So again, very excited to talk about this subject. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we are gonna go from there. And I will stop my, uh, my camera. So just disclaimer, if it's okay for me to tell the disclaimer, I'm gonna turn it off because I am using a hotspot and I just wanna make sure nothing freezes. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop that and share my screen. All right, so crafting a compelling comp proposal. And if it moves just a little slow, please bear with me again. I am using a hotspot, okay. All right, so crafting a compelling proposal, we're gonna talk about the different things that you need to think about to really make a refined and professional proposal. Um, first is gonna start out with research, right? You need to research and understand your audience. A lot of times when there are companies and businesses that are transitioning from the commercial market or private sector or consumer, whoever you're selling to into the government space, tend to think that it's just about responding to proposals and that you have to skip the whole understand your audience and, and do a market research. You really definitely have to understand who your target audience is. Um, the government has thousands of thousands of agencies out there. They all procure, even though they follow a procurement process, I mean, they're, they are still people and they still do things a little bit differently. They have different needs. They have different pain points. Um, even if you're in the space like ourselves, uh, which is training, training may look different from one agency to another. So really understanding what they are looking for so you can sell to them properly is important. And we'll go over that in just a second. Um, in your proposal, you want to define the problem and present a solution. You also want to sho showcase your team and your expertise. And we'll, we'll go over how to do that. You want to outline your pricing strategy. You want to craft a compelling executive summary. And you want to pay attention to design um, and presentation. And of course, you want to proofread and revise. So we'll go over each one of these sections. So research and understand. So a lot of times when I tell people you need to research and understand what your audience is looking for, the question is, well, how do you do that in the government space, right? How do we do that? You don't necessarily send out surveys as you would to a consumer market. You don't necessarily make phone calls to each different business trying to figure out exactly what their needs and pain points are. You do that in the form of capture management. And we touched base on this uh, slightly last time I spoke, but just to go over it again. So capture management, also known as opportunity management, discipline approach to qualifying business opportunities and developing a win strategy to improve your probability of winning a strategic opportunity, right? So basically, it's just understanding everything you need to know about that customer, about the opportunity, about the resources that you need, so you can really understand what your actual probability is of winning before you spend any time or resources. Because trust me, I've seen that a lot. Companies will spend thousands of dollars on a proposal, hundreds of hours on writing the, trying to figure out how to write a proposal and get a team together and really having assessed if it was an opportunity that they can win. And that's time, time is money, right? So we spend too much time in the wrong area or really affecting our business. So some of the things that you need to consider, and this will be shared. So FYI, if you're not able to get all of these, um, all of these points, this, this presentation will be shared. So basically, in a nutshell, what capture management is, is identify quality opportunities, understand the customer's needs and goals, determine, determine if the opportunity is a good fit, create a plan and a team, begin the process of solution, and then do a competitive analysis. And I'm going to stop there because that, that right there was a whole mouthful. So what's identifying qualifying opportunities, right? 
because we're limited on time, I can only dig into this so deep. But basically, dig, dig, dig. Oh, dig, dig <laughs> as much as I want to. Okay, I want to make sure I don't go over. Okay, so identifying qual quality opportunities. So when we first look at a solicitation, we tend to look at, okay, the due date. Then we look at, you know, the scope of work. Can we do that? Great, right? So that's good. You definitely want to look at the scope first, but then also identifying there's what they call a shred. It's an actual document that's used, um, and we use it really heavily in the federal space. And the document pulls out what they call the meat and potatoes. It pulls out when it's due, the place of performance, the type of contract, right? If it's a um, RFP, if it's an RFQ, if it's an RFI. So really pulling out what type of contract it is, how the contract pays, um, how many uh, key personnel you need on that. It pulls out all that important information so you can assess up front the scope looks good, but can I actually do this, right? Can I perform a, I'm, I'm in Georgia, can I perform a contract in California, right? It's asking for 20 full-time equivalents, which is FTE, right? So you'll see that term, FTE, um, which is full-time equivalent. Um, can I supply 20 FTEs on a contract, right? Do I have the capabilities to do that? Do I have um, the resources to hire that or hire, or hire what they're looking for? They may have key personnel on there that requires 10, 15 years of experience in a certain area with a particular degree. Can I supply that for that customer, right? So after we look at the scope and the scope looks great, these are the more, these little details that are going to determine, is it worth me moving forward, right? When is this proposal due? So if this proposal was due in two to three weeks and it's asking for a lot of say for instance, things that you don't currently have and you would have to seek and find, this is the moment to assess, do I have it and can I have it before this proposal is due? If it's not feasible for me to do that, I don't need to waste my time or my money on that, right? So this is what we talk about when we say research and understand. <laughs> um, then when we talk about understand the customer's needs and goals, that comes with building a relationship with the actual customer, right? That comes from actually having meetings in the form of what we like to call capability briefings. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of that term. So that's just setting up meetings prior to the solicitation even coming out, right? This is in the early stages when they're still doing their market research or in the early stages when it's in pre-solicitation phase. These are the times where you actually set up meetings with the customer, ask those probing questions, use that time for the customer to understand your business so and, and let them get to know you. So when an opportunity actually does come out, they already know who you are, right? So. Think of government contracting just like any other business. People do business with the people they know, like, and trust. That's the formula across the board. Even though there's a procurement process, that's just the way they have to buy, but you're still doing business with people. And they like to know who they're going to be contracting with because obviously they're using taxpayers' dollars. They have their own job and quotas to meet, and they want to make sure that they're contracting out to a viable company. So during the capture phase, which normally can be, and believe it or not, this can happen six months before an opportunity comes out. This is the time where you start identifying who the customers you want to do business with. Look at any pre-solicitations or awards that may be coming out um, or, or may be ending soon and start building relationships with those customers before you even find an opportunity. Right. No different from, again, and I'm going to reiterate, no different from the consumer market, which is B2C, no different from the B2B. Understand your market before you just go out there and just start throwing darts and selling. <laughs> it's very similar in the government space. Um, and I do want to also emphasize that it's nothing wrong with finding an opportunity that you feel really good about and you've assessed it and it's already out and you haven't built a relationship. You can still win a contract that way. But when you're talking about longevity and building your business, uh, you definitely want to start your pipeline and, and start your capture management plan. Um, and so then, then you can also begin the process of solution. So when you understand what the customer wants, right, um, you can start creating a plan um, and a team around some of the potential needs and resources that you would need coming up. Um, you can do a competitive analysis 
uh, based on the incumbent. So the incumbent, basically, that's the person who may have previously held the contract. Sometimes they have incumbents, sometimes they don't. But if they do, you definitely want to get as much information on the previous contract holder. Uh, during this phase, analyze the cost and the potential for success. There's a lot of opportunities that look great on paper when you initially read it, like, oh, this looks great. And then you start looking at their budget and then how much money it might actually cost using your resources that you have um, at your hourly rate so that you can make a profit. You got to assess, does that align? You know, because we're in this to make money. So you want to analyze the cost and potential for success. Research, of course, the customer's desires, needs, and insights. Um, that comes from, you know, going to industry days, going to networking events, and again, setting up those meetings with customers. Then you won't want to create an action plan. And all of this happens, believe it or not, before you actually write a proposal. So this is the capture phase that starts, again, with pre-solicitation, um, RFIs, request for information, sources salt. You do that at this phase before they even become an actual solicitation, right? Once that solicitation becomes live, which normally is within the next couple of weeks of those particular, you know, um, announcements, which are solicitations that end, normally within a couple of weeks, the actual proposal will come out. So now you have a head start over your competition and you already have somewhat of a compelling approach when it's time to write that proposal question yes personal question is there any rule of thumb for analyzing the costs and potential for success yeah so there's a lot of different ways that you can do that um usaspending.gov is a good way and these are free resources that i'm going to give you um usaspending.gov is a good resource that you can go to and look at previous awarded contracts um even when you go on sam.gov on the left hand side there's a toolbar right that lets you kind of cipher out what you you want what information you want to um um, to show. So when you're looking for solicitations, you can actually click on awarded contracts only or just awarded contracts and not look at any live solicitations and go through what's awarded in your, your Nate's code or look through what's awarded in your keyword search just to get an idea of what that agency potentially spent on the previous contract, um, if there was a previous contract. If not, you can still also detail that down even more to, and I'll use an example, we'll say USAID, you can break that that down to USAID, awarded contracts in training. And you can look at whatever scope is on there and try to compare costs that way. Also during Q and A periods, when the solicitation does go live, you do have the right to ask what is the budget and you do also have the right to ask, um, what the, is there a previous incumbent, which is the previous contract holder, and how much was the contract for? And they, most of the time they'll answer it, sometimes they won't, but you can also find out that way. So there's a little research behind it, but your best bet is, is again, trying to find what awarded contracts were either similar, or if you're lucky, find the, the previous contract. Um, you can ask during Q and A's, and you can also use FOIA, which is Freedom of Information Act. Um, Freedom of Information Act, you can also find out previous contract information by submitting a FOIA request with the agency. So these are all different ways that you can research. And these are the free ways, by the way, that you can research and try to get an idea of, okay, how much, what is their budget and, and, and how can I kind of um, benchmark my pricing off of that? Um, and you know, there's other ways to also, and this is what I preach to everyone is know your price, right? Have an understanding. And this goes with understanding the customers. We do business on the state and we also do business on the federal level. Well, now as a subcontractor, not as a prime, but as a sub, the state, I know a lot of times it's lowest bid, um, county, local, you know, they're going to be lowest bid. 
having a relationship with the clients, they'll tell me up front, like, hey, you had a great proposal, but we went with the lowest price. So now going forward with some state agencies that I've done business with, I already know how they price things. And so I know that, you know, when we're going off of our resources and how we want to price it, it has to be the lowest price that we're willing to accept <laughs> as a contractor. Meaning I may not know what their budget is if they haven't told me, but what's the lowest that we're willing to take based on our resources that we need to use, our personnel and our profit margin? What's the lowest profit we're willing, willing to take if we decide to go after that? Um, and then federal, you know, they have other resources that are paid, GovWin, Del, uh, Deltec, which is GovWin, and Bloomberg, um, to also help you research that. So hopefully that answered your question. Yep. Thank you. So moving on. Let's see. Hopefully I don't get stuck here. It's in the next screen. The froze. Oh, here we go. Okay. Define the problem and present your solution. So this is now that we have a, obviously a live solicitation and what we just went over that capture plan again was that was just researching and how do you research and understand your customer moving forward into a proposal. So now that you have one in front of you, um, you see what the scope of work is. Now you want to clearly define the problem in the solicitation, right? You want to have a really clear understanding and be able to convey that you have a clear understanding. You want to demonstrate how not only do you understand what the problem is, what is your solution and how you can solve it. Next, you want to make sure you highlight the benefits and values of your solutions and what you bring. It is also very important to include what sets you apart from your competition. And again, this is no different from selling to B2C and B2B. What's going to set you apart? Why would we choose you over someone else? Um, what special things do you offer that that's really that's really compelling as a solution for what we're doing that we probably can't get from somebody else? Um, and then what's also often missed sometimes is that people don't use examples. Use examples. Use your past performance to really convey your solutions. Hey, we know how to... Um, provide a solution to your, um, uh, we know how to provide a solution to your problem because we have done this in a previous contract and this is what we did. We did this exact same thing for this customer and explain, explain how you have already provided that type of solution. So that gives them a visual and say, oh, okay, not only do they understand what we're looking for, they've actually done this before and they've done it with potentially an agency they recognize, right? Or, or at least one of um, an agency that they can actually reference back to if need be. So always use examples or past performance to also explain your solutions. You want to showcase your team and your expertise. And I've had people ask me, well, how do I, how do I showcase my team? Like, how do I let them know I'm an expert? I've already told them I have this amount of years of experience. I've already said, you know, we've had all these reputable clients. Like, how do you really showcase your team? Well, you can introduce your team and highlight their expertise and experience, right, as a way to introduce your team. But you also want to demonstrate how you have the right skills and knowledge to tackle the problem, right? And you can demonstrate that, again, through past performance, previous work that you've done, um, examples of your work. And what's also very common is to use bios. It's very common to use bios and oftentimes they will ask for resumes um, and also relevant qualifications to show your team's capabilities. So when you have, say for instance, we'll think of a small contract right now. So say for instance, you have five just key personnel that are required for this contract. You know, you may have a project manager, you may have a supervisor. And in our case, and I'll speak in terms of training since we do training, we may have some trainers on there, right? So we will do a brief bio for each one of those key personnel. And we'll also submit the resume. So now you can clearly see, you know, okay, now I know who this person is in a snapshot, but also I have their resume. So I know all the previous work they've done through jobs or contracts, right? Really sets a visual of your capabilities for um, for the, the CEO or, or whoever's reviewing the, con the proposal. 
And so you mentioned, Kelsey, you start alluded to pricing. Um, so yeah, you want to outline your pricing strategy. And you really need to understand what type of contract you're dealing with to understand your pricing strategy. So you have FFP, which is very common. Well, that's your firm fixed price. And then you also have cost plus FFP, which is also another very common one. And they have time and materials. They have more, but, you know, these are the, the common ones that you'll see. So firm, fi firm fixed price, excuse me, and cost plus firm fixed. What that means is that if you have an FFP um, contract, that means if you say that contract is going to be $1.2 million, that's what it's going to be for that life of that contract, period. It does not change. So if your cost, for whatever reason, increases, if there are unforeseen circumstances that happen on your contract and it costs you more money, all that's going to come out of that $1.2 million that, that you have quoted the, the customer. The customer is not going to say, oh, you need to hire somebody else or we'll give you more money. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> they said, no, you said $1.2 million. You're going to have to figure that out. And if you don't have your costs done properly, you can find yourself in the red really quickly due to unforeseen circ circumstances, hiring, firing, just not properly quoting it correctly, you know, underbidding. So when you're creating your price strategy, understand, okay, if it's an FFP, if it's cost plus firm, firm fix, that means there may be some variables associated with that. And those vari variables could be travel, right? You really can't quote travel in a definite number because that obviously can change flights, hotels. So those type of things can get reimbursed by the government. Um, so you may have a C cost plus firm fix, but you need to understand that prior to, again, putting that final price? Do you have variables? Um, and if they are asking for FFP and there's a lot of variables in there and they're not willing to switch that type of pricing, you can ask that in the Q&As, then you have to decide, do I want to go after something like that? You know, If I know there's a lot of variables and I have to give you a definite price, that may, that may put you in a bad position. So, um, so yeah, so outline your pricing strategy. Um, so clearly outline your cost, payment terms, and any additional fees or contingencies. Um, a lot of that's already going to be spelled out in your solicitation. So payment terms are typically, typically excuse me, going to be net 14 or net 30, depending on the agency that you work with. But mass majority of the time, it's going to be net 30, right? Um, clearly outline again, your cost on the line items. They do typically provide a price sheet for you. So you don't have to figure that out, but there's often times where you have to create your own spreadsheet and define your cost. So if you have different labor categories or different key personnel or different positions, all of those are kind of interchangeable um, one and the same, right? So if you have different positions, we well, need to spell out how much each position costs. If you have materials or if you have equipment that that are that's required for this, well, you need to have a line item for that and you need to spell out how much that costs, how many units and how much each unit costs and what is the total cost. So really take that time to break down what is everything that I need to fulfill this contract, right? Down to the paper. What is everything that I need to fulfill this contract? And um and create line items for them. Okay. Um, and if there's any contingencies, right? Sometimes you can have some some contingencies. Um, in training, we do. Do you want a per person cost or do you want a group cost? Um, we can sometimes show them cost savings if it's group, and we can also sometimes show them a per person cost. So, you know, you can be flexible with that. But a lot of times, again, they will provide that pricing sheet and you need to just kind of follow their outline. Um, and so then you want to, of course, craft a compelling executive summary. So this is typically going to be your Uh oh, we lost her. Well, compelling executive summary is where we left off. We'll see if she can get back in here so we can finish this conversation. Technical difficulties happen. Um, I was definitely tuned in because I'm trying to learn all this as well. 
I have uh, we have some questions in the, in the chat, so I was trying to make sure I was learning enough to answer those questions because I know they'll be coming to, via email very soon. So let's see how long it takes her to join back in with us. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> Well, let's use this time wisely. Um, if you could, I know you have some questions. Go ahead and put those questions into the Q&A section. Um, some of those questions I might be able to answer based off the information I've received in game. Um, so if you have any questions for me uh, about investing, let's go ahead and put them to the chat now, the Q&A section. Um, but also if you have any questions about anything she's covered thus far, let's go ahead and put them in there. And so uh, we'll be prepared, ready to ask some questions. And let me know, type in the chat if you want me to say, hey, some of these things that she said in the in the presentation, I didn't really understand. Can we go back to it? Listen, use this as communication. I definitely asked her to go back and cover some things. There were some acronyms. I'm like, I don't, I don't know acronyms at all. So if that's you, um, let's use this opportunity to ask those questions. Not often that we get somebody who's given us free information, um, specific and very detailed like this. So let's use that opportunity to really. Um, you know, is to our advantage. Let's see if we got her back in here yet. Like I said, any question you have so far, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Yes, good question that I covered at the beginning. Yes, this this whole webinar will be recorded. And it, it is being recorded and it will be sent out to you. Um, she said that her, she's trying to get back in now. So let's give her a second, but it will be recorded and it will be emailed to everyone that it has, that is on. So no worries about that. You will get the information that you missed, but also um, you'll have contact information as well. Um, the good thing about it, I know somebody asked in the chat earlier, I mean, in the Q&A earlier, Danielle Jones represents um, the government contracting uh, consulting side for the Urban League. So um, you, if you're a city of Atlanta business, you'll be able to, you can go to atlnbusiness.com, hit find a business consultant and actually go to Urban League. And then when you're filling out the information, their questionnaire, you can say, I'm looking for um, consulting with government contracting and you can work with Danielle one-on-one uh, -on -one with your business to get the things that she's talking about, the assistance to set up, say, hey, I'm applying for some contracts. I want to make sure that my executive summary is accurate. I want to make sure that my business is set up the way it needs to be set up. So it's not just that, that we're having this webinar with Danielle, who's random. It's She's actually one of our, um, part of our technical assistance providers, one of our business consultants that we offer at no cost to our city of Atlanta businesses. So you can actually contact her, reach out to her, and give some assistance with your business as, a, as it relates to government contracting. So all great stuff.
All right. Oh yes, Daniel did mention Gov Gov Tech, um, and that's funny because we talked about Gov Tech last time. If you on the call with the SBA, um, I have notes on it so I can be. Uh, the other ones were USAspending.gov. We talked about that USAspending.gov as a as a as a way to see to kind of help you with accurately um, pricing out things and seeing what what pricing should look like and what other um, businesses have done or contracts have been, what the financial was on that. SAM.gov as well. SAM.gov was another one. Um, but also I'll, I'll let you know that there's a program out of, out of Georgia Tech called Apex Accelerator, A-P-E-X Accelerator. That is very helpful with, um, it's a program to help businesses get into government contracting. And so I would look into that Apex Accelerator at Georgia Tech. You just look, Google that, and it should pop up. Um, if you're a veteran, there are some programs for veterans. GAVector.org. That's G A V E C T R.org. That's a good one as well for helping with veterans that are in the government contracting space. Hope that's helpful. Seems like Danielle's still trying to reconnect. I think her phone might have dad died. So, where uh, any other questions? Let's go ahead and ask some questions while we're here, and we'll make sure that we get her back on here so we can continue. Somebody has their hand raised, but you can just ask a question, Rita. <laughs> I think she wants to speak. Rita, type your in your question into the chat. I mean, to the Q and A. Melvin, there you go. Melvin, can we receive Danielle's contact information again? Yes. Not only will this this whole webinar be recorded and sent to you, but the information of me and Danielle and how to get access to her, and also how to get um, access to the no cost business assistance that you can receive for your business will all be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, no, Investing Lenders not have a program to help you with obtaining small business certification, but the other, there are other programs that do, depending on what certification you're going for. Um, I know a lot of them are, some of them are free, and it just requires you to like do the legwork. I know that the program with uh, some of the certifications that you need for the city and for the county are provided either by MARTA or the Georgia Department of Transportation if you're going with the state. And so there are different levels, as I stated earlier. There are city contracts, there are county contracts, there are state contracts, and then there are federal contracts. If you were on our webinar last week um, with the SBA talking about federal contracts, it was advised to anybody that's starting off getting in, in the government contracting space not to try to go for federal contracts first. Federal contracts should be the, the like you should build up to that. And so the, the, I would consider the more um, accessible contracts will be the ones that are in your city and county and so start there build up some your resume a little bit and also kind of get some finances in the reserve before moving on to the uh, federal step, step so i would encourage you to start the city and county then look at state contracts and then look into federal uh, give me one second i believe danielle's trying to call
technical difficulties, technical difficulties. All right. So we were talking about um, the different levels. And so we want to be cognizant of that city, county, state, then federal. Is this the rule of thumb that we've learned? Uh, but does does it invest Atlanta have a program to help with obtaining small business certifications was the original question. And as I stated, that Marta has a program for certification depending on um, what type of contracts you're going for. There's some certification that you can get through Marta. There's some you can get through the Georgia Department of Transportation. Um, there are some that you can get along with the SBA to help you out with that. That's part of their programming. Uh, but I will also look into, if you needed some assistance with obtaining a certification, I will look into SCORE, um, the Small Business Development Center, the SBDC, which are all uh, programs underneath the SBA. Because the SBA has a lot of program they do for small business to, to help in these spaces. So the SBDC was the Small Business Development Center. I will look into that as well as SCORE. because They have programs that can help you with getting certifications. We just said City of Atlanta small businesses are struggling with invest Atlanta support with financial aid for obtaining government contracts. Um, now, financial aid and supporting with government contracts, the way invest Atlanta works is we support small businesses or help assist small businesses with with matriculating through and growing in their in their business. Um, so a lot of our loans, um, our low interest rate loans that are catered to small businesses will go up to $100,000, have low interest rates between 1% and 3%. Um, but what we're looking at is to make sure that your business can is growing, that you're solidified, um, that, you, that you have at least two, two years of tax returns that you can show. Look at that. We're back. <laughs> we'll give it a second to get situated. But um, And so we are constantly trying to to reorganize and restructure some of how our programs are operating to make sure they're still beneficial for our small businesses. But at this very moment, we don't have we don't have funding that supports government contracting. It's more if you are getting government contracts and you're making a certain type of revenue and you are showing growth and you need some funding, you can always apply for some, a loan to assist you with what your business is doing. But we don't have funding that's situated saying, hey, I'm going up this government contract, but I need $50,000 to do so. We, we don't you will have to that's why I say city, county, state, and build up some 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 funding in, of your own and then say, hey, I'm growing and this is how much money I've been making, and then present that to Invest Atlanta for additional funding. That's how that works. Danielle, you're back. Are you able to pull your presentation back up or we're gonna just talk it out? No, we're gonna have to talk it out. We're gonna have to talk it out today, guys. So disclaimer, because I like to be open and transparent. So last minute. You know, being the mom, had to take the kids to oh. practice, and it put me in a car. So I do apologize for any technical difficulties, because I do like to give my best when I'm giving a presentation, and it will not connect. So, but we will give a copy of the presentation, but I definitely wanted to be available for any questions that you may have. Again, this is something that we do for our business. I write proposals still for my own company. I have in the past for many companies before. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Or even about, we did have a mouthful too. So even about anything that we've already discussed, if you have any further questions. So maybe maybe we continue walking through what you were going to say. So we last time we stopped that was the executive summary. And we, yeah. we had just started on the executive summary. So maybe you can just talk to us um, about the executive summary and we'll just, um, you know, receive it verbally now and then be able to put that information in our notes along with the presentation once it's sit down tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the next two sections was, yeah, finish up the executive summary and then also just making it very uh, visual. So talking about graphs and how to break that information up and then proofread. So, but as far as your executive summary, um, Again, you definitely want to have it. This is your introduction to your proposal. This is going to be your introduction. This is the first thing that they read. So you want to be able to condense a lot of information about who your company is. That's how long have you been doing this? How long have you been in business? Um, what are your core competencies that are relevant to the actual proposal, right? Because we may have a lot of core competencies, right? So we use our company. Again, I like to use examples. We do uh, training, program management, project management, um, administrative services, 
um, and we do um, other consulting services as well. But if the contract is strictly pertaining to training, I might not really necessarily talk about the consulting or administrative aspects. I really will talk about the core competencies that are in relation to the actual proposal, right? What the customer is looking for and really highlight in that executive summary, our experience with those core competencies. Um, may maybe mention some of our past performance, maybe like previous customers and that, that also that executive summary as well. And just show um, shine light on our areas of expertise, whether it's how many years I've had experience, my team, um, the type of work that we've done recently. Um, and this is all just a, a summary. So not the breakdown yet. This is not your past performance, just a summary of all of that. And you want to condense that into your executive summary. So to really grab them in, um, you want to highlight in that executive summary, again, who you are. You also want to highlight your understanding of what they're looking for. And you want to highlight a very quick overview of what your solution is before you break down that solution. OK, so what I like to do um, in that executive summary is actually pull out when they say we're looking for a contractor that does X, Y and Z. Right. You'll see that at the beginning of your scope. We're looking for a contractor to execute this or we're looking for a contractor that can provide this. I would normally take that sentence, put it in my own words, just to show them that I understand that you're looking for a contractor that can provide executive training in this area for this amount of people. Right. My company has a vast experience doing that in these areas for over X amount of years. You want to lead off to just really pull them into, into that proposal. So, so those are some of the things that you need in your executive summary. Um, it doesn't need to be a whole page. It could be a paragraph, right? It could be two paragraphs. But you don't want to make it so long where you lose them, right? You just want to make it long enough where you can put a lot of that information in there and then move on to your technical approach, right? Move on to your solutions and move on to the other things, key points for, for the proposal that they have lined out for you. You mentioned so. graphs and pic do you think like pictures of some of your past work or is it like you said graphs, like what, and we're doing an executive summary, what? You had mentioned some other things that we could put on that page. So you're saying maybe about a paragraph or so, just not too wordy, but succinct of, you know, that you understand what the job is and how how your experience in past jobs add up to that just briefly. And you mentioned some other things that should go on there. Yeah. So when I mentioned the graphs, that has nothing to do with your executive summary, right? That's going to be for the remainder of your proposal to really okay. break up the monotony of just having it in form. So there's other ways that you can really convey the information that really captures it, especially if, um, say, for instance, in the scope of work, they have solutions and they're looking for six different areas for you to touch bases on, right? You you may see that sometimes in the proposal, like, hey, we're looking for a contractor that can hit A, B, C, D, E, and F. Right. All these different things that you have to address. So instead of addressing every single um, line with a paragraph, sometimes you can break that up in a table and just have a table with what they're looking for and your solution on the one side. So your left hand side may be, hey, you're, you're looking for some executive summary on the right hand side. You can write out um, in the table how you address the executive summary. They may say hybrid classes in the next um, box, you will explain how you address the hybrid classes. That way allows them to get right to the point. Everything is not lined out in, again, paragraph form. It addresses every last one of those um, key points that they're looking for. And it's very easy to read. Oh, executive summary, this is their solution. Hybrid classes, this is their solution. In-person classes, this is their solution. So it's breaking up that monotony and really allowing it to be reader friendly, especially when they have multiple um, proposals, right? You want yours to stand out and be an easy read. So sometimes breaking those up, um, again, tables, if there's something where it's easier to explain through a graph form, then use a graph, right? Um, if there's so many people that you have helped or assisted or your program has increased profitability for somebody for a, a previous uh, contract 
over a certain amount of years, sometimes using a graph, and this is what helps when having the actual presentation to actually show you what that looks like. But sometimes using a graph to show, hey, this is how I helped that last company progress over the years, year one, year two, year three, and then you can show your progression on the graph. So it allows the people to get the visual. So don't be afraid to use graphs and tables with your proposal as well. So, um, so executive summary was one key point. And actually that next slide was talking about the design of it. And the design would be to um, use creative ways to relay that information, make it reader friendly, make it really easy to show your understanding of what they're asking for in the solution. Um, and then we were actually towards the end and the last slide was actually about just proofreading. Simply proofread, let's not get lazy at the end. <laughs> and it can happen, right? We're exhausted. We spent all this time on this proposal and a lot of times, and I can tell you, I've been doing this for years and I feel like no matter how I have proposal calendars, we have proposal teams and we're always still down to the wire for some reason, every single time, because there's always something you feel like you need to get fixed and you're just ready to press the submit button, right? You're just ready to mail that thing off or what, however you have to submit it. Take that time, even if it seems tedious after all that work, to have someone white glove your um, your proposal, right? Whether it's you or you get someone else to get a second eye on it, they have what they call, especially when we have proposal teams, it's actually called the white team, right? So you do have a blue team, pink team. There's actually a white team that does that white glove, which is just proofread it, fresh eyes, the grammar areas, the grammar uh, errors, um, any other pronunciation errors, whatever the case may be, because if you have too many of those, one or two may slide through the cracks, but if you have too many of those, that affects your professionalism. Like, oh, is this what we're going to get? They have a lot of errors, so they clearly don't check behind their work. And it's a reflection of who you are. It's a reflection of your company. And the less errors you have, of course, it's gonna make a very more professional proposal at the end. So um, oftentimes, again, we. You see it a lot. You're just ready to press the submit button after all that time and work you put into it. Get someone else to read it or take the time to really just print out a copy, highlight all the way through and make sure there's no errors on your proposal. Wonderful. We got a question regarding the capture management that you spoke about earlier. I said, what systems do you recommend for capture, capture management? Sometimes it's challenging to keep up with the responses submitted for RFPs. Yeah, so um, there's addendums. So a lot of times you'll see addendums when you are responding to or when you find a solicitation that you like, right? So in SAM, a good way to track those, at the top right corner of the solicitation, you'll actually see follow, right? You want to follow those solicitations for any updates, any addendums, any changes. You are responsible for knowing what those changes are and keeping track of it because when you submit that proposal, you're actually going to have to sign a paper because anytime there's an addendum, they're going to have a, a form for you to sign to say you have acknowledged that you have read and signed all those addendums. OK, and those addendums can affect your response because there could be changes in due date. It could be changes in certain sections of the proposal. So you want to make sure you are following that. So in SAM, you can follow the opportunity. Um, when you are registered and we'll use since we're located in Georgia, obviously, um, we have team marketplace and obviously we also have some solicitations that are hosted through um, BidNet Direct as well as um, Georgia Procurement Registry. When you have your registration with team marketplace and when you register with BidNet Direct, you can also follow opportunities. They'll give you the updates. Um, when you select in team marketplace that you are going to bid on a contract, you will receive email updates as far as any addendums that happen um, or any updates that you need to know about to acknowledge it. That's going to help you also track that opportunity. Um, and they also do the same thing in BidNet Direct. If there's any new addendums, you will get a notification that there's some new addendums or anything that you need to know to track it. So hopefully that answers your question about as far as tracking updates. We'll see if they pop up another question. Well, okay. this is the time for Q&A. We have a couple more minutes left. Um, so if you have any questions that you want to ask about the, the process of putting in a competitive bid or submitting a complete proposal, 
this will be the opportunity, as I stated, to ask those questions. Um, but I will tell you this. I'll use this time. If you're going to type any questions, I'll use this time now. Um, the exciting part about all this, I think, was a question while you were gone, Danielle, is how do we get in contact with Danielle? And I told them, I said, well, here's a cool thing. Number one, I'll put her information into the email that you'll receive along with the presentation that she was showing as well as this recording. But also, she's a part of our ATL and business, um, business consulting. So you can actually go to um, atlandbusiness.com, click a business consultant, and you can actually get in contact with her. Now, what organization are you with, Danielle? Um, Urban League of Greater Atlanta. Exactly. I told them already. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't lying. Uh, the <laughs> Urban League. And so you can actually go on to atlinbusiness.com, click find a business consultant, and then scroll down to the Urban League. Click there. And when you fill out the questionnaire, if you're a city of Atlanta business, you can fill out the questionnaire. And then there they'll, they'll ask you, like, what are you looking for? And when you have that consultation, say, hey, I'm really trying to get some assistance with um, applying for government contracts or putting together my proposal or any of those types of questions. And they should be directing you to Danielle, who then you can work with at no cost to you. And that's the benefit. That's the connection. That's the resource. That's the access that you that you get. Um, so I hope we enjoyed the conversation that we had this evening. Uh, we do apologize for the technical difficulties that we had, but I think we were able to work through them. But again, if you have any questions, you will be getting the copy of the uh, of the recording. You will be getting the presentation as well as our contact information to reach out if you have further questions and how to access these resources to help your business grow. I know a lot of us are, are concerned about how to access things, but I think we've had a very complete um, webinar series. And I'll also be able to send you a link um, soon. You'll be able to go to our Invest Atlanta YouTube page to see all the webinars we've had. Um, over the last few months and be able to catch any of the ones you missed this month about government contracting or one that me and Danielle did a couple of weeks ago. So you better go back and see those webinars and catch up on those as well. So I think that's really exciting. Oh, one more question just popped in. How long does it take to get feedback after you fill out the form? Oh, what the heck? On ATL and business. Um, it should be 24 to 48 hours. <laughs> I thought it was a different question. It should be 28, 24 to 48 hours. And if that does not happen, shoot me an email and um and we'll be able to make sure that you get the response you're supposed to. And don't worry about that. Uh, you can always email us and get that help as well. So thank you for that question. But without being said, Daniel, do you have any parting words? No, again, um, just thank you everyone for your patience and understanding. And I will have this presentation over to Kelsey. So we, the good thing is we were at the tail end. So a lot of the information on that was addressed. Um, but if you have any questions, my contact information will be on there as well. You can definitely reach out. You can follow us on Instagram and all of our other social media sites if you have. And we always constantly give tips on government contracting. And yes, I definitely work through Invest Atlanta. So if you definitely want to work with me in any capacity, you know, go to the ATL and business. And I would love to work with anyone on the call in regards to government contracting. Absolutely. So thank you all for joining us this evening. We appreciate you all. Again, you'll get an email tomorrow. And if you have any questions, email us, reach out to us, atlmbusiness.com. Get comfortable with that website. Go there, explore it now. And we'll be back here sometime in a couple of weeks with a new webinar. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you all. Have a great night.